So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Nishaporik. I want to thank you for attending our grazing planning webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly Siderick. Uh, she ranches with her family near Lloyd Minster and 25, over 25 years ago, uh, they were introduced to holistic resource management or holistic management as it's more commonly referred to nowadays. Um, it's a decision making process um, that focuses on finances, land and people. Uh, this had a significant impact on their operation as it transitioned over to being more forage based in a livestock enterprise from what they traditionally had. Um, so in addition to running their family business, she works with many farm families as they work to transition to the next generation. So she was uh, very a lovely speaker for our succession planning webinar that we had uh, on April 13th. Um, so it's really my pleasure to introduce Kelly uh, for this grazing planning workshop. Um, this webinar is being recorded as well. So if people have questions or anything that they'd like to pose, please do write them in the chat or the Q&A box and we will address them uh, either during or after the presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly. Okay, thanks again, Kelly. Um, some of you may have heard this story before, but uh, lately we were confused because of our name, certainly not by looking at us because uh, Kelly Nichaporik is way younger and way taller than I am, but uh, I guess it was the uh, Ukrainian last name that uh, got us uh, mixed up. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us on this afternoon. I understand if you are from uh, Kelly's area, that Kelly Nichaporik's area, that you've got snow. So, so far we haven't got any here and we are in a similarly dry position. So we'll, same as you guys, we'll certainly take the moisture in whatever form it comes. And it's chilly. It was a toque morning when I went outside earlier. So as you heard, uh, been involved in holistic management for a long time. Some of you will know that a big component of that is the grazing planning. And so for many, many years, we have do it, been doing a holistic planned adaptive grazing. The terminology changes. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And I just, uh, again, want to invite people that, you know, I'll share some information and some of my experiences. And then at the end, I'm hopeful that we can have a good Q&A and I can uh, help and uh, we can share some ideas because I know there's a lot of experience probably out there. Um, I don't see participants' names until closer to the end, so we will carry on. I also was mentioning to Kelly earlier that I'm really quite amazed at how much uh, meeting we have been doing virtually. It wouldn't have been my first choice. I am a huge fan of in-person, but it has given us some opportunities to connect that I don't think we otherwise would have. And uh, so I'm grateful for that. And, and not only to connect, but we can also learn and share. And that's uh, an important piece of our journey forward. With this, uh, the way we're doing the uh, Zoom platform, I have one computer that I'm sharing my screen and another one with some speaker notes. So we'll see how my brain works uh, doing two things at uh, one time. So a big piece of the holistic planned grazing is getting the animals to the right place at the right time for the right reasons with the right behavior. And as I mentioned earlier, that term adaptive is in there. Um, so I would just like you to take a couple of minutes and put in the chat room your level of experience with a planned grazing um, program, or maybe it's you know whatever term you're using whether it's adaptive, some people might use the term uh, rotational grazing or, or mob grazing. I mean, there's all kinds of different, uh, different descriptors that come up from it nowadays. And uh, I noticed in the recent budget with the um, ag financing that there's money coming out to normalize rotational grazing. I'm not 100% sure what that means, 
I think it means it's abnormal now, I guess, if we're going to be spending uh, money on normalizing it. So anyway, there's different things and, and more emphasis now starting to come through with some of these kind of management strategies that perhaps we will be able to benefit down the road. Why focus on the land health and a planned grazing? I'm sure many of you have heard or are familiar with this quote on that we don't inherit the land from our ancestors, but we borrow it from our children. Just as so many of us in agriculture are trying to uh, leave the land in a better position than when we first came across it. So here's a good picture. They're calling it diamonds, investing in soil fertility as we're attempting to improve the health and the organic matter of the soil as well as the plants and therefore the animals. This happens to be uh, Scott Campbell from Meadow Lake, a great picture. Of, they've got a very successful operation at the B-Bar C up there. So when we think of combining livestock and soil fertility, we think of livestock being the tool, not only to harvest the forage and the wealth, but also through their interactions and functions to imp improve the land. So they can serve multiple functions as they mow, fertilize and generate some dollars. Soil organisms are also livestock you must feed. And then thinking about how can we integrate livestock back into agriculture, not just as a separate enterprise, ownership is only one way. Certainly when we talk about holistic management and some of the principles and practices, we often say that it is unique to each situation and people won't apply them in the same way. And I think this goes to, sh this is a good example of that. So trying to figure out how to integrate the livestock when perhaps you may not own any and, and thinking of other relationships perhaps with your neighbors or other people that you can collaborate with. Another comment I'm gonna make at this point in time is when we first got involved a number of years ago, we talked about having a paradigm shift and looking at things in a different way. And prior to that, with our cattle, we always, our pasture cattle, we always really focused on the animals. And then we said that once we got involved in holistic management, we started looking down and we paid a lot more attention to the plants that were growing there. We paid a lot more attention to the soil surface. We started to look for bare ground and think of ways that we could um, reduce that and start covering it. And now in more recent years, we're literally digging a little further to find out what's going on below the surface. And all the discoveries and learnings that are happening with soil health and all the biology and microorganisms below ground are certainly something that we can add and utilize in our management functions. So here's another paradigm shift. You know, when you think of wasting green growth, it could be cash, but it also can be biological capital capital so it isn't going to waste you know sometimes we go out there and we see a lot of forage being left behind and think oh gosh but it can go to feed the below ground organisms as well as the above ground it can also be knocked down to cover the soil surface and depending on the stage that it's at, it can also um, restore the seed bank if that's some of your intentions. And again, each situation will be different as to how they are going to apply the tools. I think another piece that's very important as we think of, especially if you're adapting and making some big changes, is we really need to focus on progress over perfection, because this isn't going to be something that's gonna have you know, a 180 um, 
necessarily gigantic change, but we will make learnings as we go. And certainly in our case, we've you know learned a lot, made progress, but we've also had missteps too. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, that times that we didn't uh, necessarily go as we planned, but we learn from those too, uh, which uh, goes with all different kinds of uh, change, I believe. So when we're actually thinking about the grazing plan, we are talking about managing the land and the soil, the animals and the wildlife, so that we can maximize high quality forage during the growing season. During the non-growing season, we also would like to have forager cover for both livestock and wildlife and have a stockpile. Perhaps the stockpile is something you're going to graze at the end of the season to extend it, or as in now, it could be something at the beginning of the season to start slightly earlier if you are um, doling out some stockpiled grass. It's, it's a way to help us deal with weather challenges as well as meeting the nutritional requirements of both the livestock and the wildlife. We want it to minimize stress on animals and people. And the planning process helps us to maximize coordination for all the different factors that we're dealing with, whether it be the cropping, the other land uses. And above all, it is a strategy to help you move towards your holistic goal. Those of you that were, are familiar with holistic management will know that there's great emphasis placed on developing that holistic goal that or context coming together as a team and creating that shared joint vision that would be a topic for another webinar but certainly the grazing plan helps us to move towards that just a little uh comment of experiences that we've had uh recently is many people that i work with are really talking about trying to improve their time management. And this can be one of the ways that we can incorporate that into our planning. Of course, it goes without saying that an, the original plan will likely um, be fully executed. We're going to have to adapt that. So keep that in mind too. We want it to be flexible and not rigid. So we're going to use the tools of grazing, thinking of that the cows are a tool. We're also gonna use the tools of animal impact. Maybe you're going to use them to um, create a situation where they would, like I mentioned, knock down some standing forage, or maybe they need to break up some capping. Maybe they can be a way to uh, really uh, treat uh, undesirable species. You know, an example of that is putting the mineral tubs or the mineral blocks in a thistle patch or a buckbrush patch. So again, thinking of the ideas, the overall tools being money, labor, and technology. And then we're going to apply some management guidelines with herd effect, stock density, the time, as well as population management. And all of these require the tool of human creativity. So we think about what our manu management considerations are with a continual feedback loop. We want to have some way of knowing that we're on track. We're going to think about our grazing areas. We're also going to assess not only our forage quantity, but also the quality of it. Thinking about our herd makeup, how are we running our animals? You know, is it a cow, one cow calf herd? Do we have um, multi species grazing together? Are the yearlings separate? Just thinking of those kinds of pieces of it. The recovery period is very, very important. And that is referring to the recovery time of the plants. We'll talk about that more as we go. And those will help us come up with our actual grazing periods. So we're gonna plan out ahead of time how long approximately we're going to be in each paddock and the order we're going to go. And then of course, as I said before, 
continual monitoring and adjusting the plan. So we wanna outline the objectives for both the grazing livestock and the grazing land. We wanna determine our grazing and our stored feed parameters, identify feed needs for grazing and non-grazing periods. Again, making note of the special considerations, putting in the number of days of grazing and reviewing the plan. So this is what the actual planning sheet looks like. Of course, there are uh, now electronic versions available. These are can be blown up into a large format. Many years ago when we started working on this, we always did them by hand. And an important component of this is there are so many factors we need to consider, and it's really challenging for the human brain to keep all those factors together and being aware of them. So if we can go through a planning process where we're writing them down, that makes us uh, much more able to adapt. And also I have discovered over time that this really is a good uh, communication team building tool because you can sit down with the team and start mapping out important areas and factors as well as there's certain times that you need to be in areas and trying to develop your plan around that again referring to the time piece you know blocking in a day or a time for holidays and also thinking of things like okay when are we going to be branding when are we going to put the bowls out all those multitude of factors go into the plan. Here's just an example of what uh, one map might look like, because of course that's an important component of it with the different paddocks and the ratings, and then some rough moves of where they're gonna go. This is what our map looks like. Um, and so it is, isn't always operated in the same way. Sometimes we'll have one herd over on, on one side of the coulee and another side on the other. I, I've heard recently talk people who are talking about creating disruption. And one of the points that we had always gone back to is really trying to do things differently from year to year. So you're not being rigid and starting at the same spot and making the same rotation or sequence of moves. I realize in some um, situations that's easier said than done, but really starting to think outside of the box. Okay, if you've been calving in a certain area, is there another place that we can start doing that? And starting to think of switching up how you're doing things. Uh, just another comment here, of course, about, you know, depending where you are in the journey as you're developing your land planning. And again, that's another topic in and of itself, but keeping in mind, you know, um, of course, existing infrastructure, trying to work with the lay of the land. You can see on our map there where the coulee is fenced out. Um, also, as you know, water development and is there ways of how you're going to strategize around your water development. The one on the top left actually has a water lane built into it. So, you know, different strategies for that. There's a number of different programs out there too to help you um, that might help fund some of the uh, water development. But of course, it goes without saying how important that is. So part of the question is what landscape are you trying to create for a long time in the future? How much total forage will the cell have to supply? And I should just say that that overall grazing um, uh, structure is what we call the cell. And then we refer to the individual uh, separations within it as paddocks trying to figure out how much forage will the average acre have to supply and how long does the standing forage last 
Here's a really important one. How long a recovery period do you feel is required once you graze and then leave a paddock for the plants to fully recover? There is a wide range there. Of course, it depends not only on the species of grass, but also the climatic conditions. You know, um, is there a lot of moisture? Is it a dry year? And then that helps you figure out based on that recovery period, how long animals would spend in each paddock and when would they return? When and where will you have to concentrate animals even more to maintain a healthy grassland, reduce weeds and woody ventation or heal serious erosion? We have a couple of paddocks on the outlying edge of ours that have not um, really had a lot of grazing pressure. And what's happened over time is there's really starting to be an encroachment of willows. So it's taken a different um, strategy because, as I said, it's kind of at the far end away from the center where the buildings and everything else is. But we have, have stockpiled some grass there and we're going to calve there and really try to hit it a little bit harder to set those um, to set the willow encroachment back. It's kind of an experiment, you know, um, just trying to see how it will work. But it, it seems that when we have um, maybe given too long of recovery, that's one of the things that happened. So again, each paddock and pasture is going to have different requirements for how you manage that. So getting into this piece that we talk about incessantly, it seems, the grazing principles. So overgrazing is a function of time and it happens to individual plants, not pastures. So ideally, we would like to graze, manure, trample every plant and then leave and allow full recovery. But again, remember, that's the ideal and that isn't necessarily how it's going to happen. So what we're really hoping for is to minimize overgrazing. And that happens when we stay in a pasture too long at one time, or if we're returning to a pasture before the plants have fully recovered from the last graze. So those are kind of the two ways that we say that overgrazing can happen. And insufficient recovery is staying in a pasture too long at one time or again, returning too soon. So both of those, uh, the insufficient recovery will certainly result in overgrazing. So some of you will have seen this photo. It's been around for a long time, but the photo or the plant on the left is unclipped. And then as moving forward over to the right, I mean, then clipped to a stubble height of first five inches, three inches, and one and a half inches at four week intervals. So you can clearly see there what has happened to the roots. Each time the plant was clipped or grazed again, it had to sacrifice more from the roots to regrow for above ground. So we're trying to make sure that before we come back again, and regraze it, that the plant has had time to regrow from some of the um, leaves above ground, but also to replenish the roots. So with our grazing planning, we're gonna focus on the parameters of time, area, and volume. And again, we're always trying to keep that in line with our holistic goal and what are the different management factors and considerations that we're operating under. The, finance, or the management considerations will be financial need, land health, future landscape description, the weather, 
geography, of course, social needs. I talked about the idea of vacation before and the existing infrastructure. You know, we've been working lately on um, doing some rebuilds and it's really hard when you have an old fence to disregard that at, you know, trying to balance between modifying and adapting what you already have versus uh, tearing it out and starting again. Everybody's um, situation will, of course, be different. So the time factor, and again, that's influenced by the volume. So how much forage is available or the animal days per acre, the number of animals and the size of paddock. So there's just an example below with some of the different terminology that we're using. So if we're getting 40 animal days per acre on five acres means we would be producing 200 animal days. If we have 10 cows, that means we would have 20 days of grazing. In this case, each animal would be one cow. So if that kind of makes sense, that's where some of the numbers that we start to use to figure out how much forage we're actually going to be growing and how we allocate it depending on the number of animals. So again, the, the forage inventory and the stocking rate are influenced obviously about with the amount of uh, volume of forage and the amount of time that the animals will be feeding the area or the size of the paddock and the recovery period and the number also times that you are going to be grazing it. So again, just working some examples, if it helps, thinking of the animal days per acre. If you have 10 cows and you want to graze for 270 days, you need 2,700 animal days. If the average animal day per acre ADA forage quality is 40 with two grazings, that means that you would be producing 80 animal days per acre. And if you have 40 acres, then that would work out to a total of 3,200 animal days which when you go back to the first part, the calculation with the 10 cows was that you needed 2,700 animal days and your projection is 3,200. So that would mean you would have adequate feed for grazing. Um, and then the piece of the other 950 animal days during the non-growing season, if you would either have to buy feed or if the animals were no longer there because they were getting sold. I hope that is a makes sense, but that's as one of the ways that we start calculating how much grazing and are we going to be requiring and how much forage can we produce to make sure that our stocking rate is in alignment with that. Again, the some more of the same with how many animals you can feed for how many days, going back to the uh, animal day per acre. So one acre is actually 43,650 square feet. So that's what one cow in, in this example um, for one day to convert it back to an acre. I, if any of you have been at uh, a Jim Garish field day, he has an exercise that's quite interesting where four of you will go and um, stand at the corners of a square and then look at the, in, at the grass that's in between inside the square and think, is there enough here to feed one cow for one day? And you know, when I've done this, no, no, so just keep backing up or close in. And of course it's a rough approximation, but then by measuring off the steps and calculating the size of the square, that can be one way of assessing productivity. Of course, you know, certainly another way would be to clip it and weigh it. And 
another um, parameter that I would suggest is if people have a sense of what an average hay yield would be, that can be converted back to uh, tons per acre. And then we use the standard rule of thumb of the animals eating 3% of their body weight dry matter. So again, if you're liking calculations and want to do some projections, those are a few ways to try to calculate what your production in an animal day per acre basis would be. So when we're thinking about the recovery time, it is again the amount of time needed for the desired plants, the ones you're trying to optimize and promote to recover. So if it is slow growth, such as in a drought or a late spring, then the recovery is slower. If it's fast growth, recovery is faster, which starts to work in such a way that seems a bit counterintuitive because when we get into a situation of having really fast growth, you know, end of May into June, we can actually move faster, which sometimes seems that we have excess forage that we're leaving behind. But the point is that we're doing this based on ensuring that plants have enough time to recover. This is an example only, but um, just one that they're throwing out there that fast growth uh, recovery time would be 30 days, slow would be 60. I think there's many instances where fast might take 60 days and sometimes it will take a whole season for plants to recover. Different uh, operations have different situations and use different guidelines for that. So I'm not suggesting that's what you use. I think you would do the research that was necessary with you know, people like Kelly Nichaporek at Lara to find out you know, what is the best in your area to determine for recovery times. So again, I was uh, jumping ahead actually when I was saying that when it's slow growth, we have to slow down because we wanna give the plants more time to recover. Slow down our moves, I mean. And fast growth, you can move faster. Because even in a fast growing time, if you're staying sometimes longer for three than three days, a plant will recover enough that that cows will come back and regraze it again. So then, you know, there's different ways, strategies that you can use to uh, achieve that. Sometimes strip, strip grazing or using electric tape to make smaller paddocks can be a way to help with that. It can also be a way to increase your stock density and get a more uniform graze. That's one thing that we've observed over time in, in paddocks that are bigger, where we're not getting the same um, stock density, they're getting where they're uh, not consistent with the graze and some are getting, uh, some of the uh, undesirables are getting left, which turns into a, a cyclical situation. Something else I'm often asked is how many paddocks should you have? Well, more paddocks equals more recovery, more flexibility, just as I was getting at there with the greater stock density and more even utilization with the tramping and fertilization. Again, just as I was saying, using temporary electric fence can increase your number of paddocks without additional infrastructure. There's definitely people I know that are, are setting their paddocks up in such a way that they can very easily strip graze and are moving the animals each day to achieve some of those goals. There's just a, a picture, it's from a few years ago now, but uh, you know, one of my uh, favorite sites in the spring with lots of lush green grass and newborn calves. That happens to be on a place uh, where there is a lot of organic matter because there used to be some pens there. And uh, yeah, over time, 
a lot of uh, material was built up and as you can see the grass grows quite well. So again, carrying on with the number of paddocks um, without getting too much down the rabbit hole on calculations, but if you had four paddocks and they were 10 acres each, you have 40 acres altogether. If you want 60 days of recovery, then you need to take the number of paddocks minus one. So three paddocks grazed for 60 days means that you would be grazing each paddock for 20 days. So that's getting to be a fair uh, amount of time and overgrazing could occur in fast growth. But think of this one, scenario two, you still have 40 acres, but this time you have 10 paddocks of four acres each. You're still working with the 60 day recovery. So taking the number of paddocks minus one, because you're always in one, that would mean nine paddocks for 60 days recovery would work out to seven days grazing per paddock. Again, better animal performance and minimize your chances of overgrazing. So certainly the more paddocks you have, then that increases your ability to increase your recovery time. The importance of animal performance, you know, to monitor that, to make sure that they are performing well with the weight gain, milk and fiber production, and the animal health, looking at the urine, or thinking in the dung forms, gut fill, behavior, eyes, et cetera. I think that one of the things that we are just wanting to emphasize is it is a balance and it can't just be about the plants and the and what's going on with them. We also need to make sure that our animals are performing well. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, dung and making jokes about uh, what kind of pictures do you have on your phone? And I know lots of us grazers do have cow pie pictures and there's some apps that you can use now to assess that. I remember somebody saying that a good indicator of cow pies is if they were the consistency of a pumpkin pie. So, you know, when you see ones that are like that, that is a, a good indicator of how animals are performing. And of course, as you all know, that running cattle, there'll be times of year when they are a little softer or a little firmer. And here, this picture too, just shows already the the bug activity that's going on in that cow pie as it's drilling down into the uh, bottom of it. So just going to put this out there and I am quite hopeful that we aren't going to be requiring these principles too much this year, but just to mention um, some principles that we can apply when we are in a drought and one of those is to combine herds so that that'll give your um, the plants that much more time because you won't be in more than one paddock at a time. Again, slowing down. We've already talked about this. Referring to slow growth means slower moves. So we are increasing the recovery time. Sometimes in a drought situation, you might have to supplemental feed. You know, I remember, this is a number of years ago, quite a few, I'm dating myself, in the 2003 drought, where we did end up just stopping and feeding out on one paddock. Now, it goes without saying that we really, really hammered that particular paddock where they were left for a longer period of time and getting fed on. But... The flip side of it was that we were giving all the rest of the paddocks time to recover and not be overgrazed. Or maybe it's a fact of reducing numbers. So just again, there's different principles that we can start thinking about. One of the strategies 
when since then when we've had drier times is because of our paddocks and and records we can look ahead and say okay if it doesn't rain in the next x number of days we have this much feed and then we can work back from that with some trigger dates to say okay well if it has not rained by this date we're going to have to go to plan b or whatever that is but it does give a little bit of peace of mind knowing that okay we have a month of grazing or 45 days or whatever the case may be because in in more often than not we have had the moisture in that time but it is good to know what you're going to do also thinking about when is the best time to breed, birth or wean. And one of the recommendations is trying to work with nature as much as we can. And that's been a long time principle with holistic management and planned grazing. We also want to be sure and talk about the ecosystem processes and recognizing that they're principles of natural laws. So we have the water cycle, how effective is it functioning? We have the mineral cycle. Again, how well is it functioning? It's very closely connected with the water cycle. Then thinking about energy flow and how, how much plant material do we have out there to capture solar energy? And what is the community dynamics or level of succession? So what are the different species? Do we have all age groups and really trying to create obviously a healthy grassland ecosystem. And thinking about our grazing planning can work with or fight against them. And this was a, my dad was very fond of this quote that, you know, mother nature has deep pockets and always bats last. So the more that we can work in sync with that, the better we are. There was just a story problem time there where we were starting to figure out some more things, but I think we've had enough on the uh, calculation piece of it. Here's a, a picture of a set of yearlings during the summertime uh, being moved. And one of the tricks in, you know, livestock handling is a whole nother piece of this, you know, and trying to move our animals in a manner that's low stress and doesn't cause a lot of uh, upset. So teaching them to follow something. Um, this particular side-by-side -side has a little uh, frame on the back with mineral blocks in it, and they soon uh, learn to follow that. Plus, in our experience, it doesn't take them long at all to realize that when you go out and open a gate or lift up the fence, um, they're going to good new fresh green grass and the animals quickly learn and pick up on that, that that's what is going to happen. You know, there is um, another strategy and, and this was a long time ago that we learned about this was blowing a whistle, you know, so that when the animals hear the whistle, some of those are probably more applicable for yearlings where the cattle are changing every year. You know, I think in many cases, a cow herd that stays on the place, they really quickly adapt and get the hang of what's going on, to be sure. Another strategy, and I don't have a picture of it, but I have one of the uh, very important pieces of this. And if you don't have one of these for your electric fence, finally got one. Not only is this the fence tester, but this one has a remote so that we can turn it off when we're away from home to fix a fence. You know, we talk about the, the, the barriers when we're using an electric fence so that uh, it's only that one single wire. It doesn't seem like a lot, but as anybody know who's touched it, it, uh, it puts out a lot of uh, juice. So those are some of the, the pieces of it. And again, you know, we sit down and put those factors into place on our planning sheets, make the calculations, figure out our order and do a plan of where we're going to be when. And that really helps to um, simplify things, but also helps us be better managers and be more inclusive and of our team members too, so that everybody has a good picture and idea of what's going on. So I haven't been watching the chat box for any questions, 
But I think with that, that is uh, the formal part of my PowerPoint. And I really like to open it up for some discussion. So I think I'm not sure if we can raise the hand on this one or type in the chat box or, you know, we can talk about different um, pieces of it. Kelly can uh, do that with us. So. Kelly, can I get you to um, unmute your mic and see if there's any other areas that we might want to focus a bit more if people have specific questions? Um, nothing's come up in the chat yet. Okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing. And then, um, so there was some people, that, okay, that were uh, quite new to rotational grazing. Okay, Shiana, hello, been re rotational grazing for 13 years. So people won't like this when I go in and look and see who's in there, but um, Shiana, would you like to comment on one of what have been some of your major learnings? You can thank me afterwards for calling you out too. Oh, maybe she's not on there. I'll have to, now I'm looking and seeing. Don Christensen, he's here. He can definitely make some comments. Oh, Shiana's coming on. So Kelly, um, I should have asked you this earlier, but does, do you have to unmute them? Yeah, I can unmute everybody. Okay, okay. so Cheyenne's here. Now? You're a good Cheyenne. <laughs> and Dawn, you can be ready for next. So I think probably one of the biggest things for us was uh, um, looking, looking at our biggest downfall and addressing that first. Um, and for us, that was keeping track of our financial stuff. And so once we got a good system going for that, then, then we um, kind of work our way down and find, okay, what's our next thing that, that maybe is, is our, next, our next biggest issue. And so, um, but, but really like the grazing planning thing, I wouldn't say we're doing a great job of it yet, but it's, it's like a work in progress, but it's huge, you know, like just like Kelly said, to give yourself an idea of, of okay, well, we're sitting in August and things are looking pretty dry how far can we make it? Or, you know, do we need to reduce? Do we need to do some, some changes? That kind of thing. I think, so I think the grazing planning is, is really a huge thing. And, and like I said, we're not, we're definitely not there yet, but we're working, you know, working towards, towards getting it, getting it to be a, a better tool for us. But I think that's a huge, huge learning, learning part of, of, uh, of it for us anyways. Um, thanks, Shiana. One of the things that, that I'll, I'm just going to comment too that we've really utilized because we change up the type of stock on our place. So the mix is always a little bit different. We'll have some cow calves, we'll have some yearlings. Um, you going back to be able to keep track of an animal day per acre or a total animal day is very helpful because then if you're switching to a different class of stock you can say okay well we got this many animal days and it's it's standard whether so you can just plug in if it's going to be yearlings or cows i think that's been really helpful as well as a way to keep track of um production you know i also should have said and i didn't mention it on the when i shared the map was technology has just come such a long way to be able to, you know, with Google Earth or there's the Alberta Agriculture Soil Viewer. There's a lot of different uh, tools available to us today that really can help um, help our production and our planning instead of hand-drawn maps where you're kind of guessing how big the acres are, as well as some um, holistic management has a grazing uh, process, but there's also the apps. There's, you might be familiar with Pasture Map or Maya Grazing. Those two ones are, I think they're both subscription. They have trials, but uh, really uh, helpful tools to be able to uh, manage and plan. 
Uh, Kelly, I'm going to go through and see if Don Christensen is still on here somewhere. If he did want to uh, make a comment or if he left. Okay. Plan, 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 and don't overgraze. There we go. Thank you so much for that. So they uh, don't have the the uh, camera or, or the mic. Yeah, I think that those are really, really good points to think about that, you know, if you're hesitating, if you should be moving, should we stay one more day? You know, if it's decent growing conditions, don't move them. So uh, yeah, without it uh, wanting, going into the thinking about how long and complicated it can be to calculate some of these things it's like so many others right once you've done it a few times then you get the hang and it hang of it and it is um easier to approximate so is anybody else have any more questions um i already made the again you just put them in the chat room if you do and or you can raise your hand too um Thinking about a piece of this when I talked about the normalizing rotational grazing, which I need somebody to tell me what that means. But, you know, another context this falls into is the ability that through a grazing process program to sequester carbon. And that is seeming to be an issue more and more all the time. And certainly integrating livestock, and maybe it is beyond um, a perennial forage. Maybe it's starting to incorporate cocktail or cover crops. And it's so interesting. I think the soil health movement has gone a long way to developing a lot of different strategies that uh, that we can think outside of the box. And then hopefully, you know, if we are managing in such a way that we are sequestering carbon, you know, that there's going to be some kind of programs. And not that I want to hang, hang the whole hat on that, but it would be nice to know that producers are going to get uh, compensated and rewarded for effective management practices. Now, beyond that, of course, if you can increase the production with uh, improved grazing and livestock management, then that's certainly uh, a win-win and you are ahead of the game. So Kelly Nichapur, do you think there's anything else that we would like to, uh, okay, here Dawn is saying they don't turn yearlings out till June 7 and increases carrying capacity by 30 to, I got to read that one again, it popped off increased capacity by 30, 504, run them 100 to 120 days. You know, I think that is a, a piece of advantage with the yearlings is if you are feeling pressure on your grass, you can have them gone early. So certainly Dawn has a lot of experience with uh, grazing and running yearlings. I guess if you were starting relatively from scratch, um, I guess maybe what would be your top three things to, to focus on or how would you move from, let's say, just sticking them out on a quarter section and you wanted to start implementing some kind of rotational grazing or um, trying to improve pastures that way? Like what would be your top three things that you would focus on? That's a great question. And my top first one undoubtedly is going to be water. And then often, you know, if you have some existing um bigger fields even if you think of dividing them in half and then a quarter like right there you know now you're four paddocks instead of one if you do that in two places now you're eight instead of two you know and, and especially i think keeping in mind when you're designing is if there's a way that you could strip graze and uh, a water line or a water lane can help you do that because that really increases your flexibility where you can have them quite a bit tighter or give them bigger spaces depending on what the um, circumstances are and you know I think another big piece of that too is a, you some of you won't be surprised to hear me say this but making sure you know you're sitting down and trying to create that long-range vision and goal 
with your team and your family or the other group you're working for because um, that the North Star, right? That's the guiding point. And then you can make your decisions in accordance with, is that taking us where we want to go? And also figuring, figuring out the financials of it, you know, um, and, and, you know, being careful to being mindful of uh, animal performance. And certainly, you know, we might have a little bit, I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to leeway with, um, with cow calves, but you might not with, uh, with yearlings. So really being mindful of that. Another really great bit of advice that I've gotten learned from another holistic management educator from Australia, actually, his name is Graham Hand. And he talks about safe to fail trials. So just go out on some areas, it can just be a small one, and give it a try. Because if it's just a, you know, 30 acres or whatever, it's not going to be the downfall of the whole operation. And I think any time that we can do that, well, let's just try this, you know, um, that can really uh, increase our learning. And another thing I think is to collaborate and network. And honestly, as a technology plays into this too, because you know some of the resources that we have out there, Holistic Management International, their website is holisticmanagement.org, um, the Savory Institute, Holistic Management Canada. There's so much on the grazing end of it. Many of you will be familiar with Jim Garrish. You can Google him. Uh, somebody else who's done a lot of work on grazing, studying it and um, monitoring it is Dr. Richard Teague, T-E-A-G-U-E. So there's all kinds of resources and everybody that's actually doing this is more than happy to share and they like sharing their knowledge. If you haven't watched it, check out the Soil Carbon Cowboys video. That's another good one. Peter Bick, B-Y-C-K, has made some really great grazing videos too. One of them is called Animal Impact. Another one that's quite interesting about the White Oak Pastures operation is 100,000 beating hearts. There's another one, a ranch and a fence. Um, and also I just, uh, you know, feel free to reach out and uh, connect with me to ask some more questions. And, you know, being involved with your local applied research association like Lara, before we signed on, we were talking about with Kelly, you know, the idea of, and we're not sure this summer what field days are going to look like, but, you know, when things do get back to their new normal, whatever that's going to be. There's all kinds of different field days around in the summertime that you can go and, and look at people's grass and uh, see what their strategies are. And there's just so much that can be learned. So I think there's a lot of really excellent uh, resources out there. So learn as much as you can. It's also about mindset. Um, I've heard it before where it's like, think of water as an investment, not as an expense. Also yes. Hurdle. Um, we do have a few hands up actually. So, uh, uh, Devin, go if you want to unmute himself. Hello, Kelly. Yes. Hey, uh, first off, just thanks for doing this and taking the time for us and teaching us. I just have a question about our pasture. I'm lucky enough to have a few quarters uh, in the same area. Some of them mm -hmm. are better than the others. Mm -hmm. But some of my land is hilly and rocky and it's pretty much overgrown with like bushes and uh, thorn bushes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you think some of the better uh, options to do would to be to like strip graze it and let them stomp it down or maybe spray it out at this point and maybe try seed some other stuff in there? Um, you know, Devin, it's a little bit hard to say and I'm going to give the, the pat... Uh, holistic management answer on it depends but you know trying to, certainly if you can strip graze and get some high stock densities without sacrificing animal performance you'll be amazed at the uh 
uh, the results that that can have. But you know, that being said, also, is that one of the things that people have found is that sometimes when they start dividing a more productive piece of ground, that will really kickstart that one. And some of the others might be a little bit slower to, uh, to come along. But certainly, like I said, you know, the example that I use with those willows and the brush encroachment, I mean, we're going to graze that probably more, well, not probably, we're going to, our plan is to graze that more severely than we would an average pasture, but that's because of the objective of trying to set that back, which will encourage better grass growth. I mean, there is some other technological mechanical means too, but just trying to outweigh, you know, look at the different options that you've got, compare them financially, Think about how they're impacting the ecosystem. And again, is it taking you to where you want to go uh, for your future um, vision? Thank you. Somebody else have a hand up? My moderator, Kelly's helping me with that. Uh, Shanna has her hand up, so she can go. Hey, Kelly. I was Hello. just ask um what is the numbers in that in the study that sh that talks about for every day early that you turn out onto grass how many weeks it sets you back i had someone ask me this question this morning and i couldn't remember the numbers do you know that i don't i don't but one of the observations i'm going to share and and dawn's uh Don Christensen's comment in the chat box about turning out a little bit later is supporting that. But again, thinking back of stepping back and looking at the whole um, operation and thinking about, so not only where are you gonna be in your first few weeks, but ultimately then how long is that gonna take you to get to the end. So again, thinking about your strategies on your individual operation of what you're trying to do, you know, if it's a fast clip through to encourage more regrowth. So again, I, I, I don't, I'm, I don't know the answer to that number, Shiana, but you know, again, it depends on what your situation is. And, you know, right now, is there a stockpile that they will be could be eating, you know, there's th all those different factors. So a non-answer. <laughs> well, it's okay. I just, I, in my mind, I was feeling like it said for every day that you turn them out early, you're going to set your grass back two weeks. Two weeks. So if you like, you know what I mean? So if you thought about yes. waiting five days more to turn them out, that could give you 10 weeks, hypothetically more, 10 weeks more for your grass in the end, right? But I'm not not positive if those numbers are correct. But I remember when I heard it, I was just dumbfounded by by the numbers of how one or two days could make such a vast difference later on, right? Yes, yes. And again, it kind of goes back to Devin's question too. You know, like what's going on with the rest of the um, operation? And like you mentioned earlier, looking at the finances and and you know balancing stocking rate and and those type of things. And again, you know, um, not severely grazing in some spots. So again, it depends. Yeah. Just a, a note for Devin, what would it be an option to uh, custom graze some goats or something? And that would help get rid of your, your shrub issue and they would they would maybe bear it down and uh, then your cows would come in there, come in there later on in the, like in your second cycle and, and they would be able to find the grass better. Um. Well, I was up there the other day and it's <clears throat> like, it's a lot overgrown. I don't see like too much quality forage in the middle. I don't know what goats eat, but I guess I just, I don't see too much uh, like grazing potential there unless, <clears throat> and the soil is pretty well sandy and just full of big rocks. And it's only ever been, I heard the term the other day, Columbus grazed, where like we just let our cows out and I move them quarter to quarter, but I've never really uh, done selective grazing in smaller paddocks. And every time the cows go into this quarter, they hardly are ever in this 
in, in those hills, they're all near the water in the lowlands. So I pretty much have to force them to go there to maybe start getting some positive results out of it. And like Kelly said, it's, it's a long-term thing where you just have to keep on working with it, I guess. It, and might, hopefully... be, it might be an ideal place to bale graze on. That's just what I was thinking. Yes. And my cows, I guess it's a long ways from water, but I guess they'll just have to learn how to eat snow mm -hmm. like, like the deer. Yeah. And, and certainly that is a good point, you know, and that kind of fits in with the winter feeding strategy, but the impacts that, that people have found with different bale grazing strategies have been really significant because the, it would likely uh, hammer down the, the more shrubby uh, forb type bushes. And as well, it would add a lot of organic matter and soil enhancements to the uh, to the area as well. And maybe it doesn't even have to be winter either. Maybe it could be, um, you know, early spring, late fall too. You know, another thing that people talk about is with those different buck brush or whatever, you know, is if you spray something on it, like a mineral or a salt, then the cows will eat those. From my understanding, and I have, I'll be the first one to admit, I have no personal goat experience, but that they are browsers. So they don't really eat grass. They're, they'll eat the forbs and the trees and the shrubs. So I was actually talking about that with Steve Kenyon the other day, because he's going to incorporate some goats and thinking about then if you're like, are they actually eating any of the grass? You know, when you think about what, when you're providing food and forage for them. So uh, interesting anyway. In the chat, Don Christensen said that for every one day before June 1st, you'd, he says that you'd probably get two to three days longer at the end. Okay, yeah, that, okay, that's good advice. Shiana, you got that one. So it's doubling or tripling there. Um, and as well, we have a question in the question and answer box. It says, I'm wondering whether you can talk about seeding the pasture. What is the best time to do this and how do you incorporate this into your grazing plan? Um, certainly one of the things, and we haven't actually seeded anything for a number of years, but um, you know, a few strategies is to do it with some sort of companion annual. And again, if planning it into, uh, if it is going to be part of the grazing plan, making sure it's at a time when it has been established enough that you're not going to set it back too much by grazing it. Um, another thing that we haven't gotten into a lot in this conversation, but is the idea of the more species, the better, you know, that biodiversity, the complexity and, you know, a, a, my dad used to say, find as much different species of the as cheap as you can, because of course it's expensive to seed stuff down. You know, there has been people through grazing and, and feeding strategies that have just let it go back, so to speak, and utilize the, the seed bank that, that was there before. One of the things about that is that it does take time. But if you can, you know, again, I really like that idea of safe to fail. So is there some, you know, for Devin, if there was one area there that he could really try to just really impact it and maybe beat a bit on it and, and see what happens with it. Um, I see that somebody's also uh, asking about a recording and it is being recorded. And so I assume as with other situations then that Kelly will send us a link out after the, after the session for the recording. I think there was another hand up. Um, I don't know, I think Bev had her hand up, Beverly. Okay. Uh, yes, my question is, um, we got a lot of Kentucky bluegrass, and what we're looking to do is try to get this reseeded and back into something more, more productive. Uh, what would be a good strategy on approaching that? Well, you know, a number of different ways. I've seen where they talk about the frost seeding, which I think we've uh, perhaps missed this year. 
Um, if there is bale grazing, there's another way where they've been spreading, you know, the seed out. Um, even something that's not, won't um, cover long periods quickly or big, large periods quick, large areas quickly, sorry, is to incorporate some seed into your mineral, uh, especially if you've got a loose mineral tub that you're using. But, you know, there is some of those drills out there that will direct seed um, legumes or whatever seed you want into an existing sod. You know, I think a lot of people will say that moisture is such a key factor in that one. But um, those are sometimes it's just broadcasting and, and it might be using the animals to trample it in and get seed to soil contact. And, you know, the, again, also keeping in mind, the more soil cover there is, the better chances of that um, working. Kind of a general answer there, but. Uh, Would you recommend uh, breaking it up or just uh, leave the old root stand in? You know, it honestly depends. Again, you know, I keep going back to that one you know, with uh, what your situation is and, you know, what what numbers of animals you have and what kind of costs. But again, sometimes people are using with a cocktail crop mixture, trying to um, trying to incorporate reseeding in that way. Also the bale grazing, winter bale grazing, don't forget you've got a seed pack coming in with a hay bale too. So again, it depends on your situation and what would be most cost effective and work along with your own um, situation and goals and objectives. Thank you. You're welcome. Diana, you still have your hand up. Would you, is there something else? No, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Diana, though. Okay, well, that, uh, I hope that's been helpful. And uh, hand up. yeah. I have sorry. one more question. Oh yeah, go ahead, Devin, sorry. Um. You're talking about putting seed into like the mineral mix for animals. Yes. Have you ever heard of, you know, if you have like a copper deficiency, everyone says how hard it is to uh, like spread it over your land. But have you ever heard of putting like copper into a mineral mix, then the cows just uh, drop it all over your land after a while? Or is that... You know, I think in, uh, I think that that, you know, in theory, Devin, that definitely has merit. You know, one of the things that I would um, think about, and, you know, so you're looking at your mineral cycle there, um, is in order to get that with the cows, you probably need fairly high stock densities in certain, you know, so if there's areas where they're confined or for shorter periods of time that might be a way to do it you know time is a time is a factor again that um and how quickly that would uh have a result there's so many interesting things coming out you know and i mean when i start talking about other um experts in the field and go to soil health and Alan Williams and that whole Soil Health Academy guys, you know, um, Nicole Masters is really good on that, uh, you know, end of things. And I guess now we're getting into the chemistry of it as well. So there's lots of good resources out there, Devin, that could help with that also, I think. Yeah, I guess I was reading, yeah, Alan Savory's book the other day, and that's what he, he tried it in Africa. Yeah, so I guess you just have to find your weakest link on what the so in your soil, and I guess just try to improve it from there. Exactly. If it's, if it's copper or something else, maybe that's something you could try. But I guess uh, you just have to figure it out and just keep on improving. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, another thing in holistic management we talk about is, you know, figuring out what your log jam is. And so in the overall operation, you know, is there something really preventing you from moving forward? Because if you can address that, that's a wise use of resources. We also talk, like you're just saying, about the weakest link and trying to figure out what, um, 
what is that in the enterprises? And then addressing that would become a wealth generating expense. So, you know, when Kelly Nichapurik is referencing the water piece of it, that kind of comes to mind on that one as well. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for spending the time with us. Oh, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. Again, I wish we were all sitting around the tables in person having a conversation, but this is what we do these days. So, Well, I can make one last call for any other questions or comments or anything like that. Well, Kelly, thanks again for organizing this and definitely thanks to all the attendees. Uh, great to uh, see some, well, I'm not seeing them, but uh, recognize some former uh, old friends as well as meet some new people. So uh, definitely along the way, you know, we'll uh, hopefully bump into you at the, uh, the next in-person grazing event that there is. Yes, thank you everybody for taking the time to attend on this snowy afternoon. <laughs> Much needed moisture, so it's all good. <laughs> Send it my way, please, please. Okay, well, thank you so much and ever have an enjoyable afternoon, everyone. Okay, take care. Bye guys, thank you.